you know, body language. Body language, I feel like, is so much a part of communication than what you're actually saying. So um, if you're closed in your body language or if you're scowling or if there's a smirk on your face, all that stuff kind of communicates uh, louder than actually what you're saying. All right, so welcome to this episode of What to Say and How to Say It. We're going to be talking about three keys to create mutual respect in sticky situations, even if you think you're going to fail at this. I'm Nina. And I'm Shai. And this is a super important topic because the way we interact with each other communicates to the world who God is. They will know we are Christians by our love, right? Ugh, that No pressure, guys. No pressure, right? <laughs> but so we want to cover how do you do this stuff? What, you know, why mutual respect? What does that even look like? And in sticky situations and conflict, I don't know about you, Shy, but this is tough for me. Absolutely. In the moment, especially, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We do the things we don't want to do. Um, and, and I know as sure as I know, I'm sitting here talking to you that the things I don't want to do come from wounding and lies, I believe within me that need to be expunged. Right. But sometimes we need, we just need skills in those moments that, that, you know, tease ideas that if we haven't been healed, if we are triggered, what do we do with that? Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, Absolutely. So I think probably the first thing that nobody's going to like is, is the first one would be shut the ever love and love up, you know, shut up, stop talking because any kind of negative communication is disrespectful to ourselves. Does that make sense? I mean, is well, that horrible? Well, no, it, it, it's a new concept. I, I would say it, it's not horrible, um, but I think most people probably don't realize that they're disrespecting themselves whenever they are being negative. Uh, Yeah. Can you maybe explain that a little bit more? Okay. So (laughs) this is, this is creation in action. This is brain science. All right. So we have in our brains, these things called, they call them mirror, mirror, I'll say that again, mirror as in mirror, mirror on the wall, mirror neurons. Say that three times fast, I dare you. Okay, so anyway, these things, just like they sound, they reflect and they reflect what somebody else is doing. And so when I yawn, you're inclined to what? Yawn as well. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. And then you got the smiling baby thing. Who doesn't smile when a baby smiles, right? So we're contagious with each other. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is when I'm tossing negativity at someone or they're tossing it at me, it creates this thing called a mirror neuron gap. And so that creates mm. space between us. So that is where this all starts. So the disrespectful behaviors, when I behave like a jerk, which unfortunately, I'm, yeah, I'm sorry, guilty as charged now and again, less than I used to, <laughs> but yeah, when I'm terrible, triggered, right? Um, that does not set off any mirror neurons in the other person. It creates a gap. And so they want like nothing to do with me. They, and that's the way it is with anybody that's acting like that. They're repulsed by those behaviors. And so when we disrespect ourselves, we're acting ugly, right? Right. Yeah. So uh, when we think about that, you know, what are some of the things that you've seen people do when they act ugly in conversation, those negative communication behaviors? Yeah. Um, yelling, raising their, their voice. I think for one, sometimes Mm -hmm. volume can just, uh, turn you off immediately. (laughs) Definitely. And, you know, I tell speakers that when you're in front of a group of people, the last thing you ever want to do to get their attention is yell. Mm -hmm. And so the free speaking tip, um, whisper and Mm -hmm. move your body towards where the people are talking and look at them. This creates pressure uh, non-verbally. Everybody in the room starts looking at that little crowd of people. And then they look up at you and you say, thank you. And then you move on and then you give your talk (laughs) or you teach your class or you hold your meeting or whatever. And so that volume thing actually diminishes 
the perception that somebody else has of us. It's really disrespectful to ourselves as well. So, and that's a thing because um, if we don't have control of that, um, we're perceived super, super negatively, which is not useful to the sticky situations. Right. Yeah. I can see how that would create a gap uh, for sure. Cause if you're yelling, um, chances are I'm not going to respond or I'm going to yell back. And now mm-hmm. we're, we're mirroring negative behavior. So yeah, that makes sense. Um, I guess another thing that I noticed is, you know, body language, body language, I feel like is so much a part of communication than what you're actually saying. So um, if you're closed in your body language, or if you're scowling, or if there's a smirk on your face, all that stuff kind of communicates uh, louder than actually what you're saying. So um, yeah, I would guess that would create a gap as well. It absolutely does. <laughs> and actually, there's this landmark study that Alfred Morabian did out of UCLA. And it was done in the 1980s, but it's it's a legit thing. People quote it all over the place still. And what he found was that when your words don't match your nonverbals, people believe the nonverbals 93% of the time over whatever you said. Mm-hmm. You know, you see, you think of slamming your hands down on a table and standing up, you know, that's pretty doggone aggressive, right? Right. And so no matter what you say in that, you're, I'm not angry. Well, tell your face, you know? (laughs) (laughs) I like that. Uh, Tell your face. That's funny. (laughs) Um, Yeah. So um, I don't know. Um, What do you think might be a way to mitigate that? Um, you know, how do we do it differently? Yeah. So I think it's tied to point number two, which is that whole maintain emotional control thing, which I have a love hate relationship with, honestly, because sometimes my inner five-year-old just wants to have its temper tantrum of course. And, and nobody likes to admit that we have that in us. And we get our feelings hurt and then we're resentful. I mean, all of that is immaturity on our part. Nobody likes to know that. I certainly didn't like to hear that. But when I realized that, and I had a number of friends that are psychologists, psychiatrists, counselors, and they all tell me the same thing about the DSM-5, which is the big honking book of all the personality disorders, mental illnesses. And they say that a handful of those are actually biologically based, but the majority of them are just um, immaturities personality development that gets stunted and we don't grow out of that. And emotional control actually creates credibility and mutual respect. Cause if you can think about it, if you can hold your tongue, if you can maintain calm when the world is falling apart, um, people have a ton of respect for you and you're able to respond to them respectfully. So that's, that's definitely a thing. And I know that, you know, some steps for dealing with emotional control stuff. Like what do you do with them when they happen? Yes. uh, The steps have been amazing in helping me manage when I'm triggered, when I'm, you know, dealing with something really, really hard. It's, it's definitely helped. So yeah. Um, I have to say, there have been times where I have uh, had to fake it. (laughs) But um, as I do the steps more and more, you know, it it does get easier, you know, in the moment. So, yeah, I I do them, too. I think there's not a day that goes by where I'm not doing those things. Yeah, that and just to give you a couple of them so our audience can can know them. um, There's the first one is name the emotion. You know, what am I feeling? And what that does is it takes the uh, brain's activity from the emotional center of the brain and moves it over into the logic space. So it's like, okay, what is this? I have to do something analytical. 
And so we, we've taken our attention over into a different place, which then lowers the level of intensity of that emotion, which mm-hmm. is super cool. And there's data around this. Um, Dr. Kristen Neff out of University of Arizona has b- written a book on self-compassion that talks about some of these things. The other one is normalizing. And this is a big one for her where we, we normalize that anybody would feel like this. You know, pe- we want to know <laughs> that we're not some freak of nature <laughs> and that we're not alone in the universe that somebody else has felt like this and um that's super important and her data suggests it's a really big part and again that takes the level of intensity down and so we have more emotional co- control in that space um and then there's the third step which is all about um desperation for me because i'm like okay it's called gentle truth or i'm sorry comfort so I ask God to comfort me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sometimes I have to ask him, what am I feeling? Um, is this normal? And he'd, he'd be like, will you be mad? But underneath that is you're really hurt. And yes, that's normal because I made you a human, you know, and <laughs> even when I'm doing that, he's comforting me. But sometimes I just need him to say, hey, I love you. Come here and crawl up. <sighs> and then I yeah. sit there. It's so sweet. And we need to receive those things because usually we'll try to make it truth happen. And that's step four, which is gentle truth. Um, yeah. So Lord, what do you want me to know here? And usually it's something really cool about the circumstance that we wouldn't normally know. Um, or it's something about ourselves that we're not aware of. Um, like, oh, I guess I did actually insult him before he yelled at me. Oops. You know, (laughs) Yeah. yeah. Yeah, me too. Right. And then we take responsibility for our piece in that, which means we go apologize. We know what's our piece to own. We don't over apologize. We just own our piece, go apologize. And and that's moving forward in integrity. So we take ownership over our stuff. That's step, I don't know, five or something. You re- take responsibility and then act with integrity. You know, how do you move forward? Which is repentance, right? You right. know? Yeah, metanoia, turn and go a different direction. That's what repentance means in the Greek. So I love that so much. Sorry, I got kind of fired up. <laughs> no, <laughs> I it's okay. I'm glad you, you you went through that. Um, and you know, for me, the steps are basically just, you know, taking thoughts captive. Right. Mm. So, you know, I have I have um found it to be very, very much so scriptural in that way and that when we give ourselves that truth we can replace that thought or emotion attached to that thought and like you said repent and so the more we do that the more our minds are renewed the more um we become like christ and the more calm we can be (laughs) in those (laughs) moments um so definitely have you noticed that that the more you practice those the easier it gets. Yes. For me, I have noticed I can do them faster. Um, it, it occurs to me, uh, in the moment more Mm -hmm. in the beginning, I used to, it took me a a while, like a minute or or two or four, you know, to, Mm -hmm. to realize I have a skill, I have a tool to use. And now it's like, Oh, okay. I'm triggered. Let's, let's do the steps. Mm -hmm. So yeah, for sure. You know, it, it, I got to be on the time. So the first time I did this, it, I couldn't talk to my husband for a whole week. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew I had nothing good to say, right? Yeah. And I couldn't get past step one. I don't know what I'm feeling, but right. I don't like it. Right. And yeah. And it was just, you know, I was blaming him. I was doing all these really unproductive things. I literally didn't talk to any, he, 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 God love him. He says, so what's going on with you? Are you upset at me? And and I said, you know what? I don't have anything good to say right now. So I just, I just need time. It's, it's, I can't talk to you right now. And he's like, okay. You know, and God love him. He made it through the week. And then by the end of it, I was like, oh yeah, I could have just asked for help. <laughs> Cause he's a good guy. Right. I was mad. Yeah. I got mad because I was crawling around on the floor, picking up Christmas wrapping paper. And my kids were little and I was like, I'm the only one that does anything and blah, blah, you know, and, I, and he's sitting there reading the newspaper. I could have just said, Hey, baby, will you help me clean this up? And he would have done that. Yeah. But instead, you know, Satan got me. Right. Yeah. And I just stayed in my head and complained and fussed. And yeah, boy, that was fun. 
<laughs> but now it doesn't take a week anymore to get there, right? It's like- no, no. <laughs> yeah, and I don't, I've, I've matured out of that level of selfishness. Uh, um, most of the time, there's nothing that immature, but um, well, I don't, well, I, I don't know how true that is, actually. There's still some things that I'm like, mm, I don't, mm. but the, I do, I, I, I can do it in a conversation. And my family, um, cause you know, we, we, the, you know, we do this stuff at work and we can nod our head and stand. And then sometimes I just, this is going to sound terrible, but sometimes I just stop listening when, especially if somebody's verbally vomiting at me. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. I just stop listening, go inside my head, talk to the Lord. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Lord, what am I feeling? Why mm. am I feeling this? What is it? You know, is this normal? I walk through all those steps and I can do that in about well, the fastest I've done is about 20 seconds. Um, and he's been so clear in that moment. Right. But that's a space where I've been healed or mostly healed. So I don't okay. have the triggering going on that right. at a real high level. It'll be something mm-hmm. small. Um, but if sometimes I need to remove myself from a conversation and we tell people to do this, whatever you do, don't make things worse. So right. back to point one, <laughs> which is yeah. stop talking, you know, I love you. Or I, you know, I really want to finish this conversation about the project. I need to take a break from this right now. And you get up and leave the room, you know, mm-hmm. and you reassure people, especially if you're in personal relationship with them, that's, you know, family and whatever. I care a lot about you. I love you. I want to finish this later. I can't do this right now. And you leave so you don't blow up your marriage or your relationship with your 17 year old. Right. You don't want to make it worse. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's encouraging that this takes time. You know, this isn't something that happens naturally and that you have to, you know, practice and get better at it. So um, hopefully no one thinks this is like, you know, a quick fix type thing, but it happens, you know, over time. Yeah. And I think this is normal mm-hmm. Christian living. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, we, everybody wonders, what does that really mean to be born again? What does that mean to be yeah. born of water and spirit? What does that mean? And mm-hmm. I like Nicodemus. He was like, well, what am I supposed to do? Crawl back in my mother's womb? And, uh, no, you know, that's not what he means. You know, we are raised in the world. Right. And then we come to know Jesus and we have the filling of the Holy Spirit and we we get it at like a whole different level. Yeah. And then we need to grow the ever loving love up again. Mm-hmm. We, need, we need to grow up again. And that's what this is. And so every stinking day learning, okay, that's from Satan, Lord. <laughs> what do we do with this? You know, help. <laughs> Sometimes that's the first prayer that, that we get. But as we mature, as we grow in that, then, then, and this is the best part ever, we can treat people with love and respect no matter what's going on because we have become almost bulletproof. I mean, it's really like that. I love that so much. Stuff that used to hurt me 15, 10, five years ago doesn't anymore. That's the Holy Spirit. <sighs> Amen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We had one more point. What, what was yeah. it? Respecting ourselves. Yeah. Did you have to learn about how to do that? <laughs> Still learning how to do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Me too. Me too. Yeah. You know, we see people disrespect themselves a number of ways. Um, in, in our courses, we start with something called the basics. And um, my guess is you've seen the benefits of working through some of that stuff too, like I have. Yeah, definitely. I, you know, I I still have a ways to go, but, you know, it's, it's something like the other two points that doesn't come natural. I think, um, you know, when we think of respecting ourselves, it's like, well, you know, do I even know who I am? First Mm. of all, you know, I think. For me, that was a big missing piece is who am I so that I can honor who she is. So, um, you know, I had to get there first before I could, you know, start applying some of that stuff. But mm-hmm. yeah, for sure. I'm on the way. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I love that. Me too. Um, and it's hard to do when you have little kids because 
somebody's got to change a diaper at two in the morning and your husband's traveling, guess what? It's you. So, <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Um, there's, there's elements of that, that, you know, we just don't consider, but if we're going to talk about how we create mutually respectful relationships, we have to understand that it first starts with us, you know, God, big commandment, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength as you love others, as you love yourself, right? Right. Love other people. But as you love yourself, Mm -hmm. that's super, super important. And we don't even know what that means. And and we describe that as, you know, getting some, taking care of the temple physically, Mm -hmm. doing stuff you're wired to do that brings you joy. Mm -hmm. And, and if you don't do those things, you can't offer your best self in service to the Lord anyway, if you're not sleeping seven to nine hours or exercising, you know, as your doctor says, or eating or staying hydrated, you know, all that stuff Mm -hmm. really, really matters. And so, for some, and this is a lot of people. I mean, I, I have a couple of surgeons that um, have been coaching clients and male and female, and they same, they're so busy, right? Yeah. It's almost the same as having little kids and being a mom, mm-hmm. uh, little kids, you're that busy. And, you know, there's all this pressure and stress and things have to get done and all of that. And they just don't have time for themselves. Mm-hmm. But when we create time, Mm-hmm. And, and put it up, put ourselves on our agenda and then take action on that and then struggle through the guilt that initially comes with that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that needs to be worked with the Lord. Cause there's a lie in there somewhere. Mm-hmm. Um, but when we do that, we then are able to show up in different ways and have boundaries with people. But if we can't have any boundaries with ourselves, we can't have boundaries with other people. And that's where the behavioral element of respect then comes into play. And what's interesting is there's data around this too. If we are not somebody who respects themselves, it does not matter if we're showing respect to somebody else. They don't perceive it that way. It doesn't matter if we're not, if if we don't have the street cred by how we treat ourselves, if you will. um, Yeah, it doesn't matter. It's like, well, what do you know? You don't, yeah, you know, th- we get scoffed at and it, yeah, there's data around that. So we have to respect ourselves. Hugely important. Yeah, that's so interesting. And, you know, I also think it's good when you have little kids, which which I do, uh, to model that mm-hmm. before them, that it is important to have mommy time and, you know, for mommy to take care of herself and do things mommy likes to do that you know, have nothing to do with being mommy, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. And, and for men too, you know, and, and women, you know, going out and being with your friends is hugely important. Mm-hmm. And a lot of women have trouble with it when their husbands want to go be with their friends. And that mm-hmm. is one of the most important things that they need to do. Right. Um, men mm-hmm. typically have fewer friendships than women do. Um I mean, not universally, but that's, that is kind of a thing. So when they're going to go do that, they need to do that. And Mm -hmm. yeah, if they're golfing all day, every day and missing all the baseball games and never showing up, that's a different thing. But I find that there's also a lot of Christian men that really struggle with taking care of themselves by spending time with their friends. And they really need that. Same as women, for sure. Yeah. And I, and I think it does so much for our mood, you know, and how we show up you know, and handling those difficult conversations. If, you know, you've had time to get a massage that day and, you know, you happen to get into a disagreement, you're probably less likely to <laughs> be triggered. You know? yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, absolutely. Or if I've set a boundary for myself that I'm not going to engage in conversation when I'm upset, mm-hmm. you know, and I have something like that happen and I act in integrity in that and I choose not to engage in it. I then actually build my sense of identity because I'm not creating cognitive dissonance in my head. I'm not fighting and at war with myself in there. I'm showing up as the person God created me to be. When I tell the truth to somebody, you know, when they ask me, you know, well, what do you think about this? And I say, well, you know, I understand why you're feeling X, Y, Z about it. And I empathize and I validate and I do all of those things. And then I, I say, I'm wondering if it comes from this other perspective though, if, you know, I'd like to share that if you're open to it, you know, I do a lot of cushioning in my talking with people, especially when they're upset mm-hmm. and then they'll say, well, yeah, I want to hear. And they'll say, well, I think, I think looking at it like this might be something to consider and I'll have a different opinion sometimes. And, and I say it, 
you know? Um, if we don't do that, like if we lie about who we are, if we pretend for 30 years to our spouse that we love Chinese food when we really hate it, we are betraying ourselves and damaging the relationship that we have with ourselves and our spouse because we're building resentment in there over stupid Chinese food. And yeah, that's a real example, but not from my life. <laughs> Not mine either. I love Chinese. <laughs> I, I actually like it too. So yeah, absolutely. So do you think we covered it today? The three keys for creating mutual respect in sticky situations? I think, yeah, we gave people something to think about. At least. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. So again, that's that stop talking, get rid of the negative communication because it's self-disrespecting. And then we maintain emotional control. And we gave you some steps around that. Mm -hmm. And we talked a little bit about what it means to respect ourselves. And I want to mention, um, you can find out more about this in uh, a document we got for you, a little booklet. And it's called Five Tools to Stop Walking on Eggshells. And you can find that on our website at greaterimpact.org. Hope to see you there. Mm -hmm.